Hey there. So today I'd like to start with a very special book. Have a look at this. This is Maya's Conversations Lexicon, the third edition. From 1878. I have 16 different books of this edition. So in the future we'll have plenty of information to go through with these. And today I'd like to start with a language map that I found tucked in here in the middle. So we have a world map here with all the different language families. Some of the information being a bit outdated, like this part here, Ural Altaische Sprachen. There was a hypothesis that the Turkic languages, and for example Mongolian, were related. That's a theory that could not be proven. But I want to focus today on this part here in pink. We're here with the Indo-European languages. In German, you still often use the word Indogermanisch. And we want to look at the Slavic part. If we look at the outline, we can see that this is partly in Russia, Ukraine, the Balkan, here a little corner around Hungary, up to the former German border and then to the Baltic Sea. This large other part here in Asia that you would often also see listed on the Russian, of course at the time, um, was not predominantly Russian. You have plenty of other languages, Turkic, Mongolian, and the different um, Siberian languages. So this was before the Soviet Union was established. Today you have uh, Slavic speakers in large parts of Asia, of course in Eastern Europe, but also abroad, like in the Americas. Now, we want to zoom in a little bit and see which languages are part of this family. I think for that, we'll have to close this book though and focus on a more modern one. They'll give us a bit more information and a bit more details. But we'll definitely come back to this. So here we have a modern map of Europe. It says Europe since about 1990. We have the Russian Federation here in the eastern part, up here across the Kola Peninsula, bordering on Finland. We have the Baltic states here, we'll talk about these in a moment. These are not Slavic languages, but they're closely related. Here we have Belarus and Ukraine. And Russian, Belarusian and Ukrainian are considered to be three very closely related languages, the eastern part of the language family. The western part would then be Polish, 
check and Slovakian with a couple of smaller languages that we'll also get to in a moment and there's a southern part too which includes Slovenia, Croatia, Bosnia and Herzegovina there's a Serbia Macedonia and Bulgaria This is the southern part of the language family Now you might think if there is a an eastern part, a western part and a southern part Was there maybe also a northern branch of the family? And the answer is we don't know for sure, but there is a possibility that here this little city, Novgorod, might have been a northern branch. This is a very, very old city, you might remember. I think it came up when we talked about the Vikings. Uh, so there's been a population here since the 9th century, and it was quite an important city historically. And there was a distinct dialect spoken there, but unfortunately we don't have quite enough information to determine whether it was a separate northern branch of the language family. What also springs to mind is that here we have Hungary and Romania sort of building a language barrier between um, the eastern and western and the southern part of the language family. And I guess you could even count Austria too, as sort of poking in there a little bit. Historically, you had a Slavic population here as well. But the Hungarians came in a bit later, and the Austrian population sort of became Germanized again over time. But this too was largely populated by Slovenian people for a long time. And then, of course, it makes sense that the southern and the let's say, northern part of the family developed a bit differently. Now, the question that's always quite interesting is where did these people actually come from? And the answer is we don't really know. If we're looking at Europe here in the 6th century, we can see over here, for example, we kind of just have a vague notion of Slavic people here in the eastern part of Europe. I find it quite funny. I don't know if this has to do with this being a German atlas or whether it just has to do with what we know about the different kinds of uh, groups and tribes that are around. But we have quite a um, clear image here of the Franks of the Saxons, the Frisians, Thuringians, etc. But then the Slavic part is sort of somewhere over here, a bit vague. They probably came from somewhere in this area, we don't know that. There is one theory that suggests that a Slavic population might have existed um, basically roughly in this area, I think. So what would today be the border between Germany, Poland and the Czech Republic? It's not quite proven though. And then we also have the Bulgarians here, which is interesting because Bulgarian today is a Slavic language, but historically the Bulgarians were a Turkic people that came in from further east and then settled in two different places one time along the Volga and one time here along the Danube and there's a distinction between Volga Bulgarians and Danube Bulgarians During this time here in the 6th century all the different Slavic tribes could probably talk to each other without problem the language was still um, basically Proto-Slavic. Starting to diverge here from Proto-Slavic. 
we then have some sort of dialectal differences developing between the different tribes, especially as they were moving further apart. And then eventually, by the year 1000, you have the modern languages slowly starting to develop. And I briefly also wanted to talk about the Baltic languages that we see up here. There is a theory that the Slavic languages and the Baltic languages come from one common source language, so Proto-Baltic Slavic, and before that it diverged from the common Proto-Indo-Germanic um, branch. The other Indo-European family that's relatively closely related is the Germanic branch, which we would find here. And then the north. And what these three branches have in common is that they are quite conservative, meaning you find, for example, a lot of uh, declinations, a lot of cases, a lot of forms that you can end to nouns, to verbs. Um, Polish, for example, has seven different cases. Not an easy language at the start when you have to memorize all of these. But that's a sign that they're quite conservative because that was a sign of the older proto Indo European. Now, before we take a closer look at the smaller languages, let's take a little detour. And let's look at the alphabet. So the Slavic tribes initially were not Christian. But by the 9th century, the same Skirlin method were asked to go on a mission and to Christianize the Slavs. They went to the Kingdom of Great Moravia, which today would be um, Slovakia, and they brought with them a new kind of alphabet, Glagolitish. The Glagolitic script. There are two different versions of it, a Bulgarian one and an Illyrian one, that are written a little differently. And you can see in some of the letters that there is already a similarity to the modern Cyrillic script. But some of the other forms look quite foreign. Like this one here. This here looks very familiar again. And then here we get to these really difficult forms, frankly. It's a really beautiful script in my opinion, I like this one a lot. However, about two centuries later, it was replaced by the Cyrillic script. And this is pretty much as it is used today, with a few differences. Here on the bottom of the list, for example, we can see some letters that I've not come across before. So they look a little different. And as you probably know, Cyrillic was based on both Latin as well as Greek letters, 
and developed specifically for the Slavic languages. The goal was to allow for the actual sounds of the Slavic languages to be represented by individual letters. So the Cyrillic alphabet also helped with standardizing the language at the time. It was based on the dialect of Thessaloniki, which is in Greece, where Cyril and Method were from. And the form of the language they developed is today called Old Church Slavonic. It is still in use, for example, in the Orthodox churches of Russia, or Bulgaria, or Serbia. And has quite a high status. You could compare it a little bit to the role that Latin had in Western Europe. However, Old Church Slavonic was always a lot closer to the actual languages that were spoken in the regions. If you compare Latin and German, for example, that's quite a big difference. Old Church Slavonic and Polish, though, was a lot closer together. So here we have some more examples. Here's the Russian alphabet. And on this side it says the Ruthenian alphabet. We see these odd letters again here on the bottom, the ones that I said I didn't know. And Ruthenian at the time basically referred to Ukrainian. Um, this was used in the Habsburg Empire to refer to the Ukrainian parts of the uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire. Today, Ruthenian um, tends to mean a different language, also known as uh, Rusin, I think which is closely related to Ukrainian, but it is distinct and in some countries it's actually um, recognized as a minority language and protected. Here we have Syrianish. That's an alphabet for a language spoken in northern Russia. And here, interestingly, also for Romanian. I already mentioned Romanian is not a Slavic language, but it did use Cyrillic letters for a while. So in the note here, it already says that it is more and more common to use the Latin alphabet, even though it becomes difficult to represent the Slavic sounds that you would find in Romanian as well. Underneath we have Bulgarian. Bulgarian still does use this alphabet. And I learned recently Bulgarian is one of the few languages that does not use an infinitive, which I find really interesting. And then here on the last page there's Serbian and Illyrian. Now this gave me some issues because I couldn't figure out which language this was supposed to be. There was a language called Illyrian, but it died out in, I think, the 6th century. So, you know, at the time the Slavs were actually moving into the area. And you can quite clearly see these are modern letters. So this is not from the 6th century. I then thought maybe it refers to Albanian. Um, there's a theory that has neither been proven nor disproven that Albanian descends from the Illyrian language. But it turns out Albanian's been written basically in every alphabet except the Cyrillic one. It's used Latin letters, Greek letters, um, Arabic letters, but not Cyrillic, so there's not what it can be. Ultimately, I think what this means is just generally Serbo-Croatian. 
there was a um, pan-Yugoslavian movement basically before there was Yugoslavia in the early 18th century which mostly came from Croatia and it was called uh, the Illyric movement so that's probably what this refers to and then for a while Illyrian was simply used for all the South Slavic languages so Yugoslavia plus Bulgaria sometimes included sometimes not depending on which source you're reading so there was a bit of a, a hunt to find out about that Of course there are also some languages that were not included in this list like Polish, Czech, Slovakian, Slovenian These are all languages that use the Latin alphabet And then you have a couple of smaller languages that I didn't know about until I read about this Here we're having a look at um, Central Europe during the time of absolutism and we have here in the north Pomerania for Pomerania and Winterpommern we have Schlesien, Silesia that's a part belonging to Austria and here in Saxony we have two areas called Niederlausitz and Oberlausitz and these three areas also had or have a Slavic speaking population with their own languages up here the languages Pomeranian which I always thought sounded a bit funny, I couldn't figure out what it stood for and it turns out it probably comes from Pomore, meaning by the sea as it's here, along the Baltic Sea this is a language that uh, as far as I know has died out or at least has very few speakers these days and unfortunately that's also the case for Sorbian which is spoken in the Lausitz area Neither Lausitz and Oberlausitz historically were um, two rather separate areas but they usually refer to together today and the border between Germany and Poland runs sort of right through it about two-thirds of the area today are in Germany and one-third is in Poland and um, they also have two distinct dialects with Obersorbisch, so here from the Oberlausitz having more active speakers than Niederstorbisch so Niederstorbisch is really uh, quite endangered unfortunately and the Oberstorbisch variant will probably last a bit longer these days you can learn the language in school so there's hope for a revival Silesia also is a historic region that has moved between different countries and here too you have a distinct Silesian language closely related to Polish which today also has a number of active speakers but quite a small one especially for example if you compare it to Polish which has about 50 million speakers um, Russian having 150 if you take just the native speakers with people also speak it as a second language you would have 250 million so the 60,000 who speak Sorbian that's really a tiny language in comparison and then for example here in this area you also have a minority of Croatian speakers which are protected they moved up here during the wars with the Ottoman Empire 
you might remember that there was a border, a fortified border between the Austrian Empire and the Ottoman Empire, and some Croatians fled up here and still live in this area and have their own standard variety of um, Croatian. Now, for the last part, let's have a quick look at the Balkan Peninsula. This is a bit of a complex topic and I can also give you a brief overview. Um, what you see here is the outline of Yugoslavia from 1918 to 1991 when the state fell apart. Since then we have here Slovenia, Croatia, maybe almost the entire coast, Bosnia-Herzegovina, Serbia, there's Montenegro, Kosovo and Macedonia with Bulgaria here on the border which was never integrated into Yugoslavia so though like I said there were certain theories or ideas that Bulgaria could be part of sort of this pan-South Slavian movement too. Now the interesting thing here is that Serbo Croatian was the official language of Yugoslavia, or that was the idea initially. However, Slovenian is actually quite distinct from Serbo Croatian, and it was used uh, during the entirety of Yugoslavia. There's a theory that this might originally actually be a Western Slavic language and not a Southern Slavic language. It makes sense if you consider that the entire Austrian area here was also settled by Slavs and then later you had sort of but your variants moving in again that broke this connection apart and then of course through many centuries of contact with South Slavic speakers you would have a more South Slavic appearance but yes, yeah, so that could be an explanation why Slovenians are different now, today we tend to speak of Croatian, Bosnian and Serbian as three different languages. They are very, very closely related though. And if you speak, say, Serbian, you can definitely also understand someone who speaks Croatian or Bosnian. So, are they really three languages or are they three versions of the same language? I think I've mentioned before whether something's a dialect or a language so it's a bit of a political issue and not always a linguistic one. In this case it might make sense to think of it the way we think of German. It's a pluricentric language. So there's one language but it has three different centers and each of these centers has a distinct standard that is correct in this country but it's not correct in the other one and the differences might be minor maybe some vocabulary, some grammar but overall they're very closely related and you can understand these if you speak one of them Funnily with Macedonian there's also sometimes the idea that it might be a dialect of Bulgarian, but again, politically, a distinct language with its own standard. And what I find quite fascinating is that, for example here, you might also find some smaller languages, like I said, that are closely related to Ukrainian but then different enough 
that they can be recognized as a distinct language. And these might be dialects that are sort of halfway between maybe Polish and Ukrainian. So there's no hard border, but rather a continuum between the languages and it's often a political question of where you draw the border. But largely, it's still possible to understand the languages from your branch. So if you speak Polish, it'll probably be easy for you to understand Czech or Slovakian. The reason for that is that these languages diverged relatively late compared to, say, the Romance languages or the Germanic ones. And obviously, they're still in the process of developing into their own distinct versions. Alright, so there was a brief look at the Slavic language family. Hope you enjoyed this. And I hope you'll come back for looking through more of these fantastic maps here. And these designs and illustrations throughout the book. For today, thank you for watching. And good night. Sleep well.